Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the worship of God here at Westminster today and ask that you take the pew pads that can be found at the end of the row, sign your name, and pass it on down to those you are worshiping with. Uh, today is the church picnic, and uh, some of you put your name in the book of life, and we have hamburgers and hot dogs guaranteed for you. <laughs> and some of you did not. And yet, the grace is sufficient. So even if you did not sign up for a hamburger or a hot dog, hang around and have food with us, because this will be a good time. Uh, are there other announcements that we should be aware of at this time? Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, the women of Westminster are hosting our annual salad supper. Um, I would invite all of you to join us. Um, it's a nice time to get together and share a meal. And we do have a special speaker. Her name is Lori Walker, and she comes to us from Osable Grove Presbyterian Church outside of rural York Yorkville. Um, she has been active in both the Presbytery and in her own congregation as they um, pursue a partnership with a parish in Kenya. And this partnership has allowed this church to uh, donate money uh, for educational purposes to send children to high school and college. Um, and she will tell us more about that, as well as other things um, regarding the partnership between Black Presbytery and the Imenti Presbyteries in Kenya. Um, she's a dynamic speaker and a wonderful person. She also chairs the mission committee at the Presbytery, um, so I'm sure you will be delighted to hear from her. Please join us and see me if you have any questions. Thanks. Um, we are in need of a substitute usher for the fourth Sunday of the month. Hopefully this will be a short assignment, but if this is something you can and would like to do, please see me after church. Good morning. Um, offering envelopes for the next church fiscal year are available on a table in the narthex. The only thing I ask is that you put your name down on the number of the line corresponding to the number on the box you pick, because if you don't, you don't get credit, okay? Thank you. Stand up and greet each other. Good morning. Please remain standing if you are able and join me in the call to worship projected on the screens in front of you or printed in your bulletin. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. For thus says the high and the lofty, one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. To revive the spirit of the humble.
when we come into the holy presence of God, our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us acknowledge who we are and confess our sin before God and one another. All knowing God, you know us better than we know ourselves. You have given us the capacity to think and to reason, to choose and to affirm the good. But we have often chosen poorly, following the dictates of the values of this world. We have deceived ourselves with the extent of human accomplishments, rather than devote ourselves to your truth. We have become puffed up in our own knowledge, rather than built up in love. We fail to listen to your word and to speak the truth. And all God's people say, Hear these words of assurance. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Because we have been touched by God's light, we know our sin and our salvation. As God's own people, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind. Be always ready to forgive as freely as God has forgiven you. And above everything else, be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for you.
Could we have the children? time ago when you guys were little and you were just learning to walk your mom or dad would hold on and take your hand and help you walk and they did that so you didn't fall down and get hurt and even now when you go to a store and it's real busy or there's lots of things going on mom will hold your hand out and say Take my hand so you're safe. Well, today's Bible story, one of the stories, is about a mother who was kind of afraid because she had to leave her house with her son. And she was afraid of what's going to happen to them. And the song that Mrs. Vandermeer just played on the piano, that was written by a man when he was very, very sad because some sad things had happened to him. And that song's words say, Precious Lord, take my hand, just like when your mom and dad take yours. Lead me on and help me stand because I'm tired, I'm weak, and I'm worn. And that's almost a prayer. And it really is a prayer. And it says, God, I need help. Please help me. And that's what the Bible passage is about. That mother who has to leave her house with her son and go to a different place and she doesn't know where. She said, please help me. And God did. And that's what God does. So whether you have something that's sad, you can ask God about it and ask God to help you. So you're not so sad anymore. Okay? How about we pray quick? Hold hands. God, we thank you that you hold our hand and help us when it's tired hard for us to stand, when we're tired and when we're weak and when we need help. Help us always. Amen. Let us unite in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that taught by you in Holy Spirit. Our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This morning's Old Testament lesson comes from Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. It can be found in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bible on either page 15 or page 16. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of their slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring 
shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our response is Psalm 86, number 889 in your hymnal. We will sing verses 1 through 3. For our New Testament lesson, we begin first with the book of Romans, reading from chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. The Apostle Paul is addressing the church at Rome and writes, Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Turning now to the Gospel of Matthew, we read from chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. This occurs in a block of teaching that Jesus is giving to his disciples, and it continues a passage that we read part of last week. Jesus addresses his students and says, A disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's own foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of the Lord. If you have a prayer request, we ask that you hold it up for the ushers to collect as we sing our next hymn.
Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day as we come to your word. Open our eyes to its truth. Help us be nourished by its promises. Give us resolve to stand up in your world as people who follow our Savior. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. A long time back, Sam Cooke wrote a classic song, and it starts with the lyrics, It's a mean old world we live in. And Sam was right. It is a mean old world. And we sure see it in the text that we come to today. It's a hard story that we hear about our ancestor Abraham as he deals with issues around a blended family. And it seems so odd to us that God's word comes and says, okay, Abraham, you can go ahead and get the divorce. Send your extra wife off. Now, it's interesting that God gives pretty specific directions to Abraham. And he says, Talk to Sarah, work it out, and make plans to send Hagar out. Abraham doesn't do that. Abraham has his own idea about the best way to do it. And even though we have heard in the chapters prior to chapter 21 that Abraham has become immensely wealthy, he does nothing right about the division of property in regard to, Sarah, uh, in regard to Hagar. It's terrible what he makes as a choice. Now, we should understand that Ishmael, if we've followed the chronology right, is probably about 16 at this point. And uh, that was sort of a launching age in the ancient world. I mean, that was a time when you got married and had families. Now, even if this story is a little bit out of location, we do know that Ishmael couldn't have been a babe in arms. And Abraham could have done right by her. I mean, he could have said, you're servants and cattle and land, and we, but no. In the dead of night, he sends her off with only bread and a skin of water. It's a hard thing to realize that our ancestors aren't just mistake prone but are tragically flawed and we run into this in the story of Abraham he had a chance to be generous he had a chance to treat her right he was given permission to try to start his home in a different way and he does it in the worst way imaginable maybe some of you have lived in stories like this and we should understand that it was never God's plan to do the worst thing possible for Hagar and Ishmael. That was not part of what happened as they got to recreate their house. Uh, what we do understand from the story, and this is the part we should take away, is that Hagar gets special privilege in regard to God. There's this direct conversation in which God gives assurances about her future. And God gives a promise, and suddenly her eyes are open, and she sees a well. Many of you know stories where people have come up against the worst that life had to offer. And they open their eyes, and there's nothing there for them. But we should know that sometimes there is a well. There is a way to renew ourselves, to find life, to be touched by God. And that's where the crying to God in the midst of distress becomes so important. Because then we may have a chance to see a place where God is at work where we did not see before. Eyes are opened and there's a well. There's something to draw. Now, through years of church going, and 
through years of working in the church, let's be honest, it's easy to let your faith grow brittle. To think that all your requirements are somehow met by showing up on a Sunday morning and that the hymns and songs that we do here and the scripture we read and the learning that takes place, well, that's enough. Well, no, it's not. It's just a launching pad. Go back to the well again and again. And in silence before God, you are going to find your faith renewed. You are going to find a promise answered. Clearly, it may not be the answer you want to hear. You can't imagine that Hagar was very pleased about the way these events turned out. And yet somehow there was something for her there was a promise that held her up. This promise continues as we go into one of the great and difficult passages in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's worth thinking about the circumstances around this teaching. Jesus has been with the disciples some time, and he has tried to explain to them a new vision of what God has for the world. Now, it's so hard to see anything different than what we know. And these disciples would have been raised in an environment that said, Gentiles are bad, Jews are good. Family is everything. Families had sort of compounds. A lot of times they'd share an oven or a kitchen. And families, I mean, people married young. They were 13 or 14 years old, and so they needed to stay together as children were raised. In these compounds, you can imagine that harmony is everything. Um, if you've had a house guest too long, you know the old saying about house guests? They're like fish after three days. They kind of go bad. And so here, if you can imagine always being in a circumstance where you are house guests, and you may have a little room to yourself, but you also have great common areas that you share and... Uh, how important it would be just for that to be pleasant. But Jesus says there's something more important than pleasant. And in fact, what's more important are the things that I teach you. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Well, this is pretty tough teaching. I'm going to give a really trivial example, and let's see if we can make sense of this. I'm speaking with a relative, and he is speaking with great concern about changes in the health care law. This was about the time that the Affordable Care Act passed, and, and he was very concerned. He was concerned that with the Affordable Care Act, many millions more of people would get insurance. And that would mean that he would personally have to wait longer at the doctor's office. And not only that, it might mean that the hospital that he went to was more crowded because people could now afford appropriate medical care. And I'm listening to this, and I, I thought of, all the reasons that someone might have concerns about the Affordable Care Act, and there, I'm sure there were plenty of good ones, but the idea that people might receive medical care could not be one of them. And so I said to this relative, I said, Dad, what are you saying? <laughs> And he said, well, I don't think the government should be in the health care business anyway. And I said, Dad, you're on Medicare. <laughs> there is a view of the world that says, I've got mine, and my job is to keep it. 
There is a view of the world that says, if you have something, then I am threatened by it. There is a view of the world that says, if I am privileged in society, I need to do everything I can to hold on to that privilege. That is a view of the world that Jesus says is wrong. You can do better than that. You should understand that God's love also goes to those people who now make the doctor's office more crowded. God's love also goes to those people whose society works to keep down. And now Jesus says, I'm going to lift you up. Jesus says, your friends are Samaritans. God's love goes out to that woman from Tyre and Sidon who wasn't even remotely connected to our tradition. God's love is there for everybody. And for you to hold that up and to live that out is going to put you at odds with people in your household who have other agendas and other concerns. But your job is to take the sword in your hand and say, I have heard a different truth. And that truth transforms who I am to my very core. And now I'm more worried about that truth than I am about harmony in my family compound. Um, this is no trivial thing that Jesus was asking of his followers. Can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine living in a circumstance where you would never eat a meal with someone outside your religion and suddenly saying, I want to have them over for dinner? Can you imagine a circumstance in you, which you said, we are blessed to be a blessing. And so therefore, we are now concerned with the lives of our Roman oppressors, with the Gentiles who are occupying our country. And God's love goes out to them too. It would have been a seismic shift in their lives. And just to stand up for that single truth, well, it's a hard thing. And Jesus warns us that it's going to be a hard thing. But if we take up that cross and have our identity with this one, there is a great freedom. We no longer have to shape our message to our audience. We are people that are unchanged. We have been risen with Christ, as Paul describes it in that passage in Romans. And so, as that new life becomes the new people that we are, well, somehow we can stand up. And we can say, God doesn't want this to be a mean old world. God doesn't want it to be a place where the deck is stacked and some have everything and most don't have much. God's intention is for life and abundance. And we've heard that message. And now we get to say it again. And we have been given the well that will feed our faith and let us say the truth over and over again. Let us stand and affirm that faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our prayers this morning, we have a request for someone identified as a friend, Shirley. Uh, she has been diagnosed with breast cancer and pray for progress for her and that the disease has not spread. Um, currently, two of our longtime members are in the hospital. Uh, Ray Tritt had a massive stroke and uh, in the next couple of days, the family will be making a decision about what to do about the ventilator. And uh, we pray for them as they make that decision, and we pray for Ray. Uh, Tech Sherman has been hospitalized and has been making some progress. We pray for them, and we also remember uh, Dick McLaughlin as uh, he deals with a long-term pain and injury in his uh, hip. Uh, there's a prayer request for Frankie Boron, who suffered several strokes last week and is in the ICU in Boise, Idaho. And Shadow asked for prayers on July 5th as he has an MRI. Uh, with these concerns in mind, let us pray silently. Let us pray. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer our gifts to God.
Let us pray. One and eternal God of time and space, we respond to you with joy as we lift up our tithes and offerings. The opportunity to share is a blessing for which we are very thankful. Your generous provision for our needs prompts us to be generous in return. Accomplish your purposes, we pray, through these gifts and in our lives. Amen. And now go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each one of you from this time forth and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.